So just a, an overview of, of the AMP Group. The AMP Group is, is, is a leading wealth management company in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we have, let's say, three main uh, businesses. We have the AMP Australia, Capital, and New Zealand. And within the AMP Australia, we have a wealth management branch and a bank uh, branch. You might not have uh, heard about the AMP Bank, but, but we do have an AMP Bank, and we are actually delighted to, uh, to, to inform you that we are um, uh, initiating a marketing campaign that will put the bank uh, front and center. Uh, the bank is really what we will be focusing on here around the open banking uh, or the consumer data right. Uh, and there are some some great rate there for for your loans and home loans. So please do check them out. Without further ado, to our overview of what is the Australian consumer data right. And if you look at the uh, the open banking you might have heard also about open data uh, it is actually an international trend that we see currently uh, so this is basically putting the financial data of the customers in their control that that's the main purpose of of cdr and i like to to use the the analogy of if you if you look at your internet banking you are actually seeing your data, that, that internet banking, this is where you see your data. And this way, the bank is presenting that data to, 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 to people. With CDR or open banking, it's nothing else but establishing a channel by which that data is presented to machines. And then those machines are making those pretty pictures and adding value and services on top of that data. So it is really about that three Ts uh, that where where we look at the data being uh, being still delivered to the uh, to the end consumer. The consumer data, right, at least here in Australia, uh, is not only related to banking. So currently there is uh, energy. The energy sector is in full swing on establishing the standards for for that consumer data, right. Uh, there is also discussions around telecommunication, wealth management, uh, superannuation, and other industries, even agriculture. Uh, we are talking about the tax office to also uh, open up uh, that data. And the whole premise is, is based on the fact that we move from a closed ecosystem into a more opening, opening that data up, which hopefully will we'll get into more uh, uh, incentive to to have more services and, and products through through competing uh, companies, and ensure that we also open up the um, uh, the door for fintechs and and other and other companies to to actually tap into that potential and provide value to the end customer. Uh, for the consumer data right in Australia, there is no right access, and what we mean by that is currently what you can see is your data that is in the bank, you can see that. So this is, for example, your transactions, your accounts, your balances, but you cannot initiate a change. Yeah. So meaning if you would like to initiate a payment, then currently the, the consumer data right doesn't, doesn't support that. Uh, however, there are discussions currently going on for uh, what, what is called action, action initiation. And this is broader than just initiating a payment. It could be, for example, updating your contact details, updating uh, or uh, let's say uh, renaming your, your accounts uh, or uh, uh, making applica loan applications uh, around the mortgage origination or the loan origination for that matter. So hopefully by, let's say, 2023 uh, or so, we will have that possibility that you can currently see in, for example, the UK uh, and other uh, countries around the world and and really this is this is a great opportunity uh, i i look at this and and think about for example when when the internet banking was introduced uh, looking at the consumer data right it is really something that will be in in a way disrupting these these industries uh, you can think about for example uh, uh, let's say um, uh, you can you can think about um uh, doing all your 
your internet banking in in a in a context where you are not actually tied to a specific bank yeah so if you add for example uh, origination of accounts and closure of accounts you could potentially have four or five banks on the background but what you are looking at is a holistic 360 view of of your assets if we can expand that to let's say uh, small and medium uh, companies uh, you could look at uh, sweeping or automation of of the of the uh, of the money movements across several accounts and several banks for for that matter uh, which is that that added value that that the cdr is is providing uh, but we leave that future to the crystal ball and let's let's focus now on on what we have today so on our next slide we have this is basically what we, what we are uh, currently targeting and what we have achieved so in in australia you have the majors and you have the the non majors so the majors are really four banks and those are the 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 big uh, banks in in australia and then you have the rest of of the banks uh, as part as nominated by the non majors uh, and this is where where amp bank is so usually there is a, a 12 month between the majors and the non majors so the majors will implement the the standards and requirement uh, and then 12 months later this is where the compliance dates are for the non majors and it is put in in phases so we have phase one which is mainly around your savings deposit and transaction accounts phase two is about loan and mortgages and then phase three are basically the, the other products such as your overdraft uh, business accounts and so forth and so on when we started our journey in open banking we really wanted to to have the the following principles and and the technology direction uh, to ensure that we are not building just for comply we wanted to uplift our current technologies and capabilities uh, as well as ensure that the investment that we are putting in comply puts us in a in a good position for a compete later on yeah also we based our 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 focus on the on the technology stack that that we had uh, in house and this meant that we will focus on three capabilities api management the consent management we wanted that in house there are currently uh, solutions out there where you have actually out where where uh, banks are outsourcing the consent. We wanted to keep that in house, and then the the third capability is around uh, identity and access management. And here we choose the uh, the Tivoli product. So this is really just to to ensure that when we are building these capabilities for for the um, for the open banking, uh, we are able to leverage them in in other areas. So for example, API management. That's basically our b2b integrations uh, as an example the consent management really is whenever you are talking about consent to terms and conditions or around uh, uh, the the initiative like currently the initiative of ddo you can actually store that consent uh, within that capability and then identity and access management is really about uh, the uh, the backbone so to say of uh, our access management perspective uh, capability but also looking at for example in uh, cdr there is a capability there uh, called dynamic client registration and this is really when a third party registered to actually consume your apis and that is actually done automatically so quite quite some powerful uh, capabilities there just looking at the overall and this is just a sketch right uh, this is our solution yeah so when when we look at it i'll start from the left hand side and walk through uh, to the right so we have at the top we have the perimeter security this is where we are doing our threat protection the ibm product is really providing us uh, with some aspects of the consent management when it comes to access management uh, but the main capability there is around the dynamic client registration yeah, so the whole dynamic client registration is happening within that product. And then we move on to the consent flow. This is where the customer consent to share their data. Uh, and this is across digital and Salesforce. 
And then we have the WSO2 product that is really governing and, and maintaining and where we develop all our APIs to actually share that data across our uh, system of records. And, and here we have the uh, Adobe Experience Manager. It's mainly our product reference data. So this is, for example, all the products that we are currently uh, putting in, in market with their rate, their fees, their features. The customer management system is about the customer. So this is your address, your phone number, and so forth and so, and so on. Uh, core banking system is about your banking data. So transactions, your accounts, your balances, your uh, scheduled payments, your payees. Uh, and then we have ServiceNow, uh, uh, we, where we actually automated the, uh, the outage and availability data. So what you see currently is that most of the CDR solutions are basing that data on manual uh, key, while here we, we made through the WSO2 uh, product and ServiceNow an automatic uh, integration for the availability data. What you see on the, the small circles, I'm not sure if, if you can uh, see that clearly, but what you see in the small circles is really the, uh, the how much we invested in, in each one of these uh, capabilities uh, to bring them to, to actually deliver the, the CDR uh, capability. Now, we talked a little bit about the, um, the, the context, the, the CDR in, in Australia. We talked about the solution. Uh, now, moving on to some of the considerations and the, and the opportunities that, that we leverage across this experience. And these are really, you can think about them as, as lessons learned, really. Yeah? So the first one, we knew that this is a new regime. Uh, there was a lack of local uh, experience at that time when we went out to, to see the different, um, uh, the different providers out there. Uh, it was mainly, let's say, slideway. Uh, so uh, we, didn't, we didn't see really capabilities that, that gave us that confidence that this is uh, doable. Uh, and this is where we, we met with WSO2, where they had, one, the experience from uh, the UK uh, and, and Europe. Uh, in regarding uh, to open banking, but we also saw that they are also interfacing with the ACCC here in Australia, and also the, their solution with that with that capability gave us that confidence that this is uh, that there is uh, some value here. So this is where we we partnered with with WSO2, not only for let's say the tech stack, but also for the knowledge experience and the insight from the regime that we could uh, tap into. The next one is really about uh, efficiently addressing the compliance while enabling these future capabilities. And, and this is about really leveraging and ensuring that when we, when we want to invest and build something in-house, that there is an end game to it. Yeah, It's not only for, for, for the compliance, it is for the compliance, and then we go beyond that to enable other capabilities and other uh, value across several initiatives and across several uh, business lines. As mentioned before, we were looking at the, uh, the, the banking sector, but wealth and super and, so, uh, and other industries were coming down the line. The third one is that we were looking here at a multi-year implementation. Yeah, How do we then engage and keep the, those partners engage. Uh, that was that was a key consideration. So here we we really approach this from three angles. One is we tapped into uh, uh, professional services. So this is basically where we would we would go to one of our partners and we say, look, we want one of your developers to sit with our teams to ensure that there is always that clear communication and direct communication into into the into that partner's organization. We also looked at other partners where we actually partnered to co-develop the, the solution. So this is basically where we would put both our teams to have a regular touch point to ensure that whatever we build on our side can integrate to, to the final product, but also ensure that whatever thoughts or ideas are on, on the product side, that, that we can uh, that we can leverage those. And then the third aspect 
uh, was uh, really about uh, ensuring that we have a direct link to the uh, to some of the labs in in our partners uh, to ensure that their roadmap then actually will enable uh, whatever CDR would uh, would like to achieve. And this way, we we basically invest less in the run aspects uh, and ensure that we are develop co-developing uh, those assets uh, going into the uh, the subsequent phases of CDR. Now. Looking at the, the last one is really about quality assuring the full solution uh, and also gaining insight into future development of CDR. This is where, because CDR as, as a regime, when the four majors were, were coming in, they were partnering uh, with, with other, uh, let's say, third party uh, vendors to ensure that the build is, is, is actually having um, a, a consistent and, and, and with a good quality, while when, when it came to non-majors, there was no partnering. And, and this way, every one of the, uh, the banks was, was left alone in a way. This is where we, we went to, while we were looking at the market, we actually identified a few players that, that were quite active, uh, and we partnered with one of them to, to ensure that whatever we, solution we put in place, yes, we can quality assure it internally, but that's basically us reading the requirements and interpreting the requirement. So there might be some bias. And this is why we wanted that third party uh, with, their, with their platform to ensure that we have a third uh, or, or fresh set of eyes that are looking at those requirements and interpreting them the way they, they see it. So that when we come to uh, 1st of July, uh, we, are, uh, we are not having any, uh, any challenges when it comes to integrating with the regime. With that, th these are basically the, the lessons learned that we had from, uh, from, this, uh, from this initiative. And on this, I'll just hand over to Sima, who will talk a little bit more about what lies uh, um, after that around the integration, the group integration strategy. Over to you, Sima. Thank you, Amin. Um, can I move to the next slide, then? Thank you. Okay, so the question is, why did we come up with the integration strategy? Um, we wanted to deliver, there were a lot of external and internal drivers that influence our integration strategy. So like still drivers, drivers as, as in like Gartner's by 2022, at least 65% of the large and global organization will have implemented a hybrid integration system or platform. That was one of that. Uh, industry was moving in a different direction. It, they were, uh, banks like the DBS was leading in building uh, financial services um, with open API. But in-house, we had a lot of internal drivers as well. Like uh, we were moving to cloud-driven digital modernization. Uh, we wanted to be a client-led. We want to rationalize our architecture. We, we had a lot of current technology pain points as well. We had a lot of complex technology landscape. We had duplicate products. We had current implementation that had challenges as well. And we want to deliver uh, agility to our platform. Uh, and manage the growth. People who know about AMP, our products have moved a lot. We are 172 years old. And from there, we have moved our business and our strategy as well. So we wanted to modernize our technology and then connect to our new future ready technology capabilities. Yeah. So what we are offering as a part of this strategy, um, a very hybrid integration platform, a self-service capabilities, API platform, a data exchange standard, a data analytics, I bought uh, our AI capabilities, our reporting capabilities, a governance. We are a very governed or regulated entity. So we, that's our main, call, main um, purpose as well. Plus we wanted to make sure we don't lose the sight of our security, which has become a critical in today's world. Yeah. Um, Amin, can you move to the next slide, please? Yeah, 
So we, we, we had a vision. We wanted to empower our portfolio, our, our integration platform as a service, our IPAS, to enable the agility, the innovation, the flexibility and scalability. Yeah? We wanted to empower our platform to govern and, and control their own integration independently. So that would deliver then more agile ways of delivering their projects, delivering the products and delivering to the customer, which is more client led. And also we wanted to provide a leading edge integration platform, which is flexible, which is scalable, which will foster innovation. So what are the transformation we are delivering or we are in the inner phase of delivering? Um, we've gone to cloud native with WSA2. We are transforming, transforming into our IPES which means the platform should be able to connect and combine on premise and the cloud processes, services, application, and data together. We have moved to a platform or a portfolio self-service cloud uh, DevOps, and we have moved to a multi-tenancy paper use sort of model, so which will deliver better cost management, better logging and monitoring, and we have simplified and innovated our platform. So we want to reach our objective or our purpose is to be a trusted partner and we standardize it. So with that, um, I want to leave you all with the thought. I mean, if we can move to the next slide, please. We have developed our Galaxy, which is an innovative platform, integration platform, which is a group enabled deliver, delivery of advanced extensible and express integration. So with that, I want to leave you with the thought, how are you going to develop this galaxy of integration platforms, a platform for innovation? Thank you. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to come and talk about our transformation journey.